Hello all, I hope that you're doing well and keeping well. Thank you so much for joining me today for another Inquisitive Brim podcast. And I'm Shah, your host. Music for me is an accurate and a very scenic diary for my life. It's linked to dates, times, places, and the heart. I tend to have a multifarious collection of genres that range throughout. I grew up listening to a range of different music, rock, opera, soul, funk, classical, blues, new wave, country, jazz, and that was played daily in our household. Every day there was music played in our household. I have musicians in my family. I believe that my very first big live concert I attended was probably about age seven. It could have been before, but I think I'll have to ask about that, but I think it was about age seven. And the last big concert that I attended was was Aerosmith in Hyde Park, London in 2007. I still frequent Ronnie Scott's, but I'm no longer comfortable attending large events. My energy is just too heightened and it's far too draining for me. I pick up everything around me. I'm, I'm, my energy is just very sensitive, so I pick up everything. As much as I try not to, in a venue or in a big, large place, it just, it's almost impossible for, for me not to. And also the climate, I think the social climate has changed. Although I have to say, I throw, <laughs> I throw all of that out of the window for Sade and a Led Zepp reunion. I was in France in 2007 for the O2 concert for Led Zeppelin, so... <sighs> Um, I think we're all just accepting that it's not going to happen. But just in case, one last time, guys, please come on. One last time. Now, the psychology behind why we're drawn to different artists, because as I was thinking about this intro today, I thought when I used to hear like country uh, in, in our home, it was fun. I liked it. We uh, jazz, love jazz, even the blues, although at a young age, I didn't fully understand the blues. There was an artist in New Orleans that lived next to my grandmother's house. I think his name was Ernie Cato. And he had a few hits at the time. Uh, so we used to hear music a lot. Uh, just, you know, from uh, different extended family members being musicians. But also people who lived around, you know, people we knew. I never really... I suppose the old bluegrass, bluegrass music was never really played a lot. We did hear it, but I was not drawn to it. I'm still not drawn to it, I'm afraid. But everything else I loved. I remember at one time, a friend of mine and I, we were we were eight, nine, we would run around the house singing opera. We, we thought we were opera singers. I don't know where that came from, but we used to sing opera and of course, everybody would just go, oh, my goodness, they're singing. They're trying to sing opera. But, I mean, how did that happen? And, um, of course, we used to try and belt out, uh, you know, the sounds of Steve Perry and Journey and hitting, trying to hit those high registers. But why we're drawn, I mean, the psychology behind why we're drawn to different artists and different genres, different music, it's the same as why we make other choices. It, and it's really simply because we seek more of what gives us pleasure and also of what gives us pain. So this is why we seek to listen to sad songs when we're very sad or happy songs when we're happy. Of course, this depends on variables. There's always going to be variables in there. We could talk about the brain. You know, I'm not going to go that into it, but I'll just quickly say the frontal lobes interpret music's emotional content. So if we're sad, you know, the frontal lobe there is doing some work. If you want to listen to sad music, the cerebellum processes rhythm. So you may be drawn to very, very melodic rhythm or something that makes you want to dance so you can't help but sway. And the right temporal lobe interprets pitch. So, you know, sometimes we often want to hear, well, I do, very loud music or very soft 
very soft music. Although you can blast Tchaikovsky, <laughs> you can. Yes, so this is why, depending on your mood, you may be drawn to hard, you know, core rap or rock music, seeking dominance, or you feel that you're in control, or at least that someone else is in control of what they're doing. And this is all psychological. So I would say in my top five, favorite artists because this is so difficult so this is why I'll just say top five sits a multi-talented musician I say musician because that's exactly artist yes artist is such a wide net to, to cast he this this is a musician and his name is Prince today I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Dean who has dedicated a podcast to Prince and is somewhat of an expert on all things Prince. He developed a blog very early on uh, about Prince and he was actually invited to have a private online chat with Prince to discuss being involved in creating Prince's website at the time. Prince was an innovator, especially online. He was one of the very first to start to utilize the whole idea of being online and everything. So Michael declined to be involved, but he then started his own website that evolved, eventually evolved into the Prince podcast, now known as Podcast Juice. So we're going to talk about that. Michael has a passion for art and he is an author as well, living in Seattle in the USA. He had a career in music as a hip hop artist and Afterwards, he moved into the business side of things. He's also a sci-fi buff. So he's written a book called Truth's Destiny, the Destiny Saga Book One. It's out now. Michael's art has been featured in Macy's department store in Seattle. I'm really pleased to speak with Michael today about his life, how he became interested in music, Prince, the future of music, where he feels it's going, which Michael believes could be in the form of AI, so we talk about his thoughts about that on where he thinks music is going, which is very, very interesting. I'm a lover of vinyl and live music. I, gosh, I, I cannot, the number of concerts, I still have some of the tickets from way back when, some of the tour programs from way back when, some of the tour programs from the last concerts like Whitney Houston, Tina Turner, I saw Janet Jackson. I still have all those tour books. Oh, Earth, Wind and Fire as well. Now, I'm a lover of vinyl, live music, bands. I, I really prefer bands. I'm not someone who likes to just, unless it's somebody who, like Sade, of course, who can stand up. But then you see Sade is backed by this amazing, multi-talented band, which is Sade. But so that band, oh my goodness, it just takes you places. So anyway, they, I get I, I, when it comes to music, I can digress. So I'm a lover of vinyl, live music, and it just brings to me the sounds, the smells, the emotions of my soul and my spirit. I can feel a violin, a cello, a saxophone. It doesn't have the same appeal for me as let's say, a synthesizer, although I really ate up the 80s infusion and I loved the synth. I loved synth music in the 80s, not so much the 90s. I didn't like all the stuff that was going on in Ibiza, I'm afraid. I, I, for me, I had to feel something. And, well, I like to watch. I think it's because we were talking about this the other day. I like to watch the fingers touch the keys, the strings, the horns, the, the, the sticks hit the skins. I want to see the mouth part to emit sounds. Anything short of that would be probably my worst nightmare. I get lost in the improvisation of what a band produces by just sharing a stage or a room as a collective. There is something about the energy of that collective. It becomes one. It's alchemical. It's something that you cannot produce, I don't believe, electronically. And now it depends on what you're used to as well. And that's a psychological thing as well. So although I can see how there may be an audience for many different ways uh, in which to create what we call music as an artist, I also like to watch the artist. 
it's an experience for me to just physically see someone performing, dancing or moving or just emitting what they're feeling. And I love seeing the lead singer express themselves through voice. That is what a Prince concert brought for me. All of those elements, every single one, you felt it. You felt everything he was singing. You felt, and also the ex, there was an extension of him through his other groups, like The Time and Vanity Six. And there was an initial, I, I believe it was an extension of him. So when you saw those groups, it was him. It was a part of him. Anyway, that, and that, you see, this is why I don't believe that you can separate the art from the artist. That's a whole nother podcast for a whole nother day. But I have a psychology behind that. I'm not just saying it for no reason. Uh, you know, people want to own their music and own the, w w what they do. And then they don't want to perhaps be associated with how they live <laughs> or, or what they do. I, and how, so how can you separate that? Uh, but anyway, that's a whole different thing. So although I can see how, you know, there may be an audience for many different ways. I, Prince brought that to me in concert. He brought that live experience, but also... You saw his fingers hit the keys, the strings, the skins, you know, his drums, he played the drums, everything. And then, of course, there was the voice. And I've attended many Prince concerts in different countries as well. The world has truly lost one of its premier virtuosos. And I suspect many are still feeling the loss, especially those who knew him those who loved him because they knew him. If you didn't know him, there will be a bit of a separation. I feel sometimes people can get lost with that. Uh, however, uh, this is why this Prince podcast is so extraordinary, so helpful, so wonderful. What Michael is doing there, Michael and his colleagues, what they do there is extraordinary. You know, they bring together their thoughts, their views, they dissect music, they all know about music, they all share one thing, certainly, and that's a love for Prince and Prince's music, and those who were connected with him. And Michael has interviewed many people who, who have worked with Prince. So all the links, of course, guys, will be in the show notes. I'm just so pleased. Michael's an amazing guy as well. Lovely to talk to. And I hope you enjoy this interview. I'm sure you will. Don't forget to go and visit his or his connections. Subscribe to Podcast Juice. Uh, follow him on YouTube, follow the Prince podcast on YouTube. Even I would say you may not be a huge, huge, huge fan of Prince, but you could just follow because you love music, because they talk about music there. Wonderful. And I'm so glad James found the podcast for me. And of course, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe to the Inquisitive Wren podcast, YouTube channel. And if you're listening on a streaming platform, Follow us there as well and leave us a comment on any platform. We'd love to hear from you. So please welcome Michael to the show. Michael, so nice to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Shaw, it is my pleasure. I'm excited and uh, happy to be here. Excellent. Great stuff. So I've got a lot to talk to you about today. I want to ask, let's talk about music because okay. I know this is your thing, music. So can you remember the very first record that you bought? Um, I, I don't know if I, well, see, that's a trick question. There's the album I suppose maybe I bought and like the first album I ever had. Right. Either. Uh, either. Okay. The first album I remember having, uh, more than likely it was, I could get these mixed up. So it was either the Jackson's Destiny album. Uh, I, I remember it because, you know, it was a big album. You can open it up. Mm -hmm. It was either that or uh, Star Wars, the original uh, soundtrack by John Williams. I am, I'm a massive John Williams fan because of that. Like, that sort of also sets me on a trajectory. But those two albums I remember as a child that, you know, I had those. In terms of music, I had um, story albums before that. You know, I don't know if 
you know, if it was big there, but you used to be able to buy a record and it would be a, a story, you know, an audio book, I suppose, with yeah. sound effects and everything, like for kids. Yeah. And I had a few of those. Again, I had, I'm a big Star Wars guy, so I had these Star Wars, my mom got it, album, but it was the movie on an album. Parts, some parts were edited out, but it was the actual dialogue and movie. So, I mean, to this day at 52, I can watch that movie and I know it damn near life because <laughs> I remember as a child. Right? But, so those are my early uh, albums, uh, the Jacksons and Star Wars. Wonderful. So Destiny, yeah. From what I recall, that was, I think it was orangey color, Destiny. Did it have shape yeah. onto the ground on that one? Yes, it did. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The cover, it was like a, I think on the back it was like a peacock. Ah, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. There was, I mean, looking at that stuff now, the album artwork, it, it was like uh, they were on some like epic, mm. you know, sci fi, but, yeah. you know, they were brothers standing together, united, destiny. It's, it's yeah. pretty fascinating, actually. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, that was a brilliant record. Okay. So yeah. the Jacksons. Oh, ma major Michael. <laughs> that was my first. Me too. The Jacksons, right? Just like, okay. I wanted to be Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Marlon was a dancer, though. Marlon was the one who everybody's like, yeah, that's who you watch. Yeah, exactly. So, how would you describe your tastes in music? Mm. Um, I lean toward RB, funk hip-hop soul music uh that was what my parents mm. were listening to and then as a kid of course you hear it in the background and it probably means more to me as i got older because it i associated how i felt when my parents were playing those songs and sitting at the back of the car or at home and they're playing the records and i see the album covers but i have no context of what this is it just looks kind of fascinating and hearing the music and then when you hear the music later i'm like oh that was my mom and my dad was playing i love this because it reminds me of we were together or i remember sitting in the back of the car and my grandfather was taking me somewhere and he's playing lou rawls or something so i love lou raw you know it's just like stuff like that um so that's the kind of music that i gravitate to absolutely excellent so lots of funk R&B, yeah. yeah. Lou Rawls. Well, I, I just yeah. call it black music, that's what. <laughs> black music, there we go, black music, yeah. Lou Rawls in that voice, oh my goodness. Mm. Just right. smooth, buttery, yeah. Such oh, wow. a, a masculine yes. man, you know. Yes. I, just to say, I, I, was, uh, I really appreciate there were grown men singing songs. <laughs> they weren't always kids or younger. Like grown men used to be the stars like that. You know, that was such a great thing to see that visually, too, as well. Okay, that's my dad in there. Or, yeah, he's a person of authority, but he has that soothing voice. Like right, you said, right, so it speaks to you in a certain way. I think we're missing that, actually. Mm, yeah, definitely. That is missing from, I suppose, culture at the moment. That masculine image, that strong voice. That and authority. Awesome. Yeah, you know, like, okay. I think we're instinctually you know i don't say want to be led but when the father speaks yeah. that means something it's supposed to mean something it's supposed to you know it, it, you just feel what that means i can trust him or he's showing me love and compassion it's not just always fighting or you know such an aggressive it can be aggressive love like aggressive like my daddy got me you know what i mean i think that's what a lou rawls a barry white a lot of those cats i think it's uh teddy pendergrass their voices did that for us. You it did know. indeed. I think when you sort of take away that type of voice for us, then things can get a little unbalanced. You know, it's a little bit of too much of this or that. Um, so I can just go on. About music, but. Well, that's really interesting point as well. Billy Paul just came to my mind when you were talking okay. about them as well. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were huge in the day. Um, it, you could almost you know, as I'm thinking about as we're talking, you can almost see like a shift in the tones of the vocalists through the years. So like, if you look at the time, we're talking sort of 70s, 
sort of shifts into the 80s and you know i brought up the jacksons earlier michael's voice is a different type of voice it's a very that's your little brother that sweet child you know sort of becoming a man now at this age voice but it that's what it represents that innocence mm -hmm. like oh look at little michael that's a, we all have that little prodigy young man in our family we could identify with michael why that was special you knew where that sort of came from his dad and, and him sort of pushing that up but i think it starts to bring in a different tone of voice uh of of a authority sort of black male uh persona and prince comes in as a different tone of voice of course visually it shifts from a very masculine strong presentation to they had to mask it almost to be accepted to a wider audience but i think when you listen to the voices of the singers change over the years i think there's a correlation between in terms of the culture how it sort of changes too because again i think the next strong male voices you hear coming off of sort of the tonal shift from Marvin and those to Michael and Prince is rap. Mm. Uh, the message again was a strong. It was a diff. It was from a different environment, but it was that strong, authoritative voice. You know, Chuck D from Public Enemy was that strong. He almost he almost had a preacher's sort of here it is. You know, he he took the preacher tone and put it in a rap type of almost, and we didn't even know that's what he was doing, but so powerful. And then of course. That's a very strong, authoritative voice that captures the entire generation. Oh, we can stand up. Yeah, we don't have to take this. That, you know, yeah, fight the power. And they realize that hey, the tone was starting to shift back to the strong thing. How do we shift that tone again? Because that message is saying is so powerful to those people. I think that's when you start to see the, it's the same tone of voice, but the intent behind it changes. Gangster rap. And sort of the themes that that speaks of still a very strong masculine voice, but now it's not talking about love anymore. Wow. You know, talking about some other stuff. And I think we're sort of in the aftermath of that right now. Like we got to get our community back to that strong love. It's okay for the strong voice to be about pulling us together and, and loving our women or, you know, some of these other things, which I think, uh, and I'm going to get off my rent. I think a Tupac started to speak toward that with the dear mamas and the Brenda's got a baby and he had that very strong tone, but he was talking about some love stuff too. But I think the other voices in his hot head was a little more powerful. No, go back to the gangster stuff. Keep it on that level. But how, how I got to this is just to say, yeah, the voice has changed over the years. And I think how it affects the culture is very interesting. And I, I sometimes wonder, did it happen organically or was it, you know, sort of pushed in a certain way? Because, hey, I'd rather keep them in this sort of mindset than to have them thinking they don't need us to do things. Right. Anyway. <laughs> no, I think what you're talking about is very important, actually, because you're talking about society, you're talking about social issues and right. culture. And really, um, I mean, we're going to come on to Prince in a minute, but do you have a favorite decade of music because you you just spanned three decades there so yeah. um I, I in an easy sense uh probably sonically for me late 70s early 80s you know i suppose 70s and 80s is sort of really my core i'm from the 80s so that's what i know but I love hearing the generations prior to that, like the 70s, just the way they recorded the music seems so full and thick and the different voices, uh, just yeah, and it's such a variety yeah. uh, of music and people who even like, um, there's even like some, uh, like people like Kenny Loggins and Michael McDonald, they were doing soul music and was so soulful. You know, some of the rock stuff was so soulful. You could really hear the, uh, when I say rock and roll, you can hear the rock and roll and their hard rock and, and stuff like that. And just the way it sonically sounds. I, yeah, I love the 70s and 80s. 
Excellent. Okay, that's your favorite decade. Yeah. Um, you know, why do you think music moves people? I mean, literally, you know, they move. It moves people physically to dance, or to mm -hmm. cry, or to fall in love, <laughs> or to have babies. You know, right. influence. What? Why is it that music influences people? Uh, I say music is our superpower. In a sense, for everything you just said, I mean, I think there is just something in human beings that when you hear certain rhythms or a certain tone, um, it's something that can resonate with you. And I think it goes just as simple back as the drum and, you know, the doom, doom, doom. And, certain regions of the world there's different paces to that drum but they all mean something it's almost like it's something that you can attach yourself to and sort of be led a little bit and it's okay like um what i mean like so the drum is like if you were doing something you can just be kind of doing something but if there was something that gave you some guideline it was just a beat it was just a i can i can keep up with that okay and if you throw on a melody when you make it feel good to keep up with that, dun, 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 dun. oh, okay, wow, that actually kind of feels good, you know. And then I think when you layer a person's voice in that, and you can hear somebody sing, and you like feel they can uh, they can convey emotion when they sing, and you're in tune with that, that's yeah, like. Okay, I'll do whatever you see. You know, yeah, I'm with this. Like it's like with church, right? Why why do they when you go to certain churches and they put the music on and they know, like, okay, and I can say my voice a certain way. And when we're coming on the, you know, okay, preach. And like, all oh, right, that you're being led into something. Um, and I think music does that, you know, it's a vibe, as they say nowadays. You can put on a certain type of song and know you're gonna feel a certain type of way. I want to, I want to, you know, I'm feeling a little depressed, so I need to just kind of wallow and feel good. Let me throw on some Sade, because I know that's going to make me feel a certain, ah, okay, it's soothing to hear her voice. I could throw on some Aretha. That soothing, that strong voice can just cover you like, I love this. Or you're feeling what, you know, I throw on rap is all about feelings, <laughs> or whatever. Prince or whatever. So I think music is so important because it speaks to us in our soul. It speaks to us on our conscious level. And it can be used for very powerful reasons, one way or the other. Um, I think it's a superpower. Like it's it's something we do that can influence the world. You know, and and we see that to this day. Uh, yeah. All, all cultures are coming to be no matter what's good, you can have the most money have the most superpower nation or whatever a song could seep into those and change the consciousness of all the people yeah. wow jimmy hendrix would agree with you and i've got a quote <laughs> for him and this is amazing everything you just said is exactly what he believed jimmy hendrix said music doesn't lie if there is something to be changed in this world then mm. it can only happen through music and that's exactly what you just said. Wow. wow. And we saw those social cultures, I mean, really right back to Dylan. Dylan used to write about, he wrote about a lynching, you know, in the 60s. Mm. He would really take chances back in those days. And he mm. wrote about all those social issues. And then right up to Marvin Gaye, what's going on. And then we had Wake Up Everybody, you know, Teddy Prendergrass. And mm -hmm. so, um, you're right, the social issues are important. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Speaking of Hendrix, yes. let's talk about someone who I know has influenced your life in, in, in many, many ways. So much so. Well, I suppose someone who loves the color purple. Um, not the film. Not the film, guys. Um, I'm talking about the actual spectrum <laughs> light that produces the color purple. Who is um, 
I think I heard he's from a town called Minneapolis. I, I can be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? <laughs> um, and uh, someone who has influenced you so much that you've created a podcast dedicated to all things him. So tell us about Prince Rogers Nelson. Why is he important to you? Uh, well, Prince is important because he is a man who created uh, his art from you know, very humble beginnings and changed the world. And, and the music is dope. <laughs> That's the simple thing to say. I think he's important because on the many levels, uh, as African-American, you can trace the lineage of what came before him, and he was a perfect vessel to push it to the next generation. And, at, and through doing that, he always uh, gave props homage to everything that came before him. You can hear our entire musical culture through what he was doing, and he put his spin on it, uh, which inspires the next people to do it. Um, and he was a hard worker. Uh, you know, there's people like that come every, every once in a while. Um, and good or bad, I think there's things to admire from people like that and there's things to you know there's a lot of lessons learned too to like maybe not what to do um but to see what happens when somebody just goes narrows focuses on one thing their entire life there's good and bad that come out of that and there's fascinating things that came out of what he did um and again the music is dope <laughs> like the music is crazy like it'll make you feel something you know uh and yeah, I mean, the guy is fascinating for my generation in context. I've never seen anything like that, you know. Uh, and looking back at it now, I can see, oh, he had a little bit of Little Richard in there. There was a little bit of Hendrix in there. There was a little bit of Sly Stone and James Brown, all this stuff. And it was a perfect way to learn about the people that influenced him by watching him as well. Uh, so hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Absolutely. And can you remember the first Prince record that you ever heard? Yes. Uh, the first Prince record I ever heard was actually a Time song, The Time, uh, by the band The Time. I just remember I was, uh, I live in Seattle, Washington here in the States. And it was 1980. I went to visit my family in Houston, Texas. And back then, radio was very regional. So in the area that I live, it wasn't a big black radio station per se, and they only played like certain songs versus another part of the country where there was a huge black populations. They would be playing songs I had never heard of. And so Prince never made it to where I live. They never, you know, they didn't play that. There wasn't MTV at the time. So when I came there to Houston, got to get off the airplane. And I'm a kid, mind you. My aunt knew I was into music, though. She's like, oh, have you heard this one song? I'm going to take you to the record store right now. So we went to the record store, me and my grandmother with my aunt, and she bought, uh, I remember she bought, uh, I heard it through the grapevine by Roger Troutman, another story. And she bought The Time. And I remember hearing it, and I was like, I like this. And it, it was the song, Get It Up. I had no idea what it was, who it was by or anything. I was just like, yeah, I like this. But I say that was the first thing that I heard by Prince. Many years later, I go to find out, oh, they're connected to Prince, and oh, he actually wrote this, and he's playing it. But that's where I heard. The funny thing is, when I came back to Seattle after that trip, they weren't playing Prince for the time, at least not that I knew of. So I never, it would be years later before I would hear something else where I knew it was Prince. I think the first song I knew who Prince was might have been 1999. Well, actually, no. I went back the next year to Houston again, with my and uh, my cousin took me to a house party and at that house party they were playing uh dirty mind the album but i had no idea who prince was but they were all into it like oh did you hear da, 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 da. and i'm like i don't know nothing about they talk about cooling the gang i got it <laughs> and they were they were all into prince and they were this was years before purple rain and 
they were like, oh, you got to hear this. But I had no idea what they were talking about. I just remember hearing it. I was like, that sounds interesting. Okay, that's cool. And it wasn't until years, again, a couple years later, Purple Rain came out. Then I was like, oh, that's who they was playing a few years ago in Houston. Okay, this is good. Okay. So that's sort of my intro to Prince's story is just didn't know what it was, but I, it was kind of peeking through the underground a little bit, you know. So. Yes. Because that the time that first album that was very much Prince, wasn't it? I Absolutely. Mean, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I was uh I danced on Soul Train at one point and when the really? time, Yes, when the time was on, I'm on there. Oh, <laughs> was on. Yeah, I my cousin sent me a clip the other day and said, Oh my god, that's you in the in the, the oh, time. My goodness. I know, they're playing cool and get it up. And I'm there dancing with my friend Miguel, and I was in L.A. at the time. So, yeah, it's funny. When you say Miguel, he's not the same Miguel that's doing Prince, is a DJ or something today? No, this is oh. another, yeah, no, this was another Miguel. He was still in high school. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, he was dance partner uh, for a while. Yeah, so, yeah. I, so I, trying. Yeah, yeah. I had a brief stint on Soul Train. Yeah, it was very brief. <laughs> but the uh, train was I just remember I would go visit my dad sometimes I would spend the night spend the weekend with him I just remember Saturday morning he was like oh are we watching Soul Train real quick and then I'm going to take you to da 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 and I didn't know what it was at first and it came on and as a kid seeing Soul Train it you know I'd never seen anything like that so in my mind it plays way more sexual than it it ever was, but just because I'd never seen women dancing, I was like, whoa, I was like, are you, is this on, how is this on TV? <laughs> yes. So it was, was such an influence. Uh, so, okay, so the time, love the time, have all this stuff. Um, yeah, so that's interesting. Now, Podcast Juice, mm -hmm. so tell me, is Podcast Juice the, the, the actual, I know that's the website, but just for my viewers out there as well and who will be introduced to you, is it the podcast as well or is the podcast just called The Prince Podcast? So it's a couple of different things. That's right. a good question. Um, it originally was just called The Prince Podcast. Oh, you know, we've been okay. doing this thing, I would say probably 17 plus years. Wow. Yeah, fantastic podcast for a very long time back when it was really a podcast <laughs> yeah and nobody knew what podcasts were but it was just called the prince podcast it was just me and my best friend we were big prince fans and i had heard of podcasting at that time and i was like you know what man let's just and i had a little office you should just come over and we'll just talk about prince like we normally do but i just record it um so that's how it started Wow. And for many years, that's what it was called, the Prince Podcast. It wasn't until, I think it was after Prince's passing, actually it was, where I had to change the name or I agreed to change the name because the Prince estate, I suppose, you know, they came to us and was like, hey, you know, that makes it sound like this is our podcast official type of thing. I was like, okay. So we worked out a thing where I would call it the podcast on Prince or podcast oh. on Prince. Hmm. But in the interim of that, of those 17 years, I have other interests besides Prince. Sure. So I created other podcasts and I just decided, why don't I just create a network? Um. So we had called it, it used to be called Freedom Train Online for a lot of my older fans or listeners. I know what that was. And then it morphed to Podcast Juice, which is the home to the Prince Podcast, uh, the Work It Like a Job podcast. There's been many shows throughout the years. So that's sort of the umbrella for it all. So you can go to Podcast Juice and see all of them there. Um, if you went to your favorite podcasting uh, platform, you could search Podcast Juice and it would come up that way. Or uh, like YouTube, uh, I think it's Prince Podcast or Podcast Juice. So it, it kind of has two names. For the Prince community, yeah, they just know it as the Prince Podcast. Uh, or you know, They'll just look it up that way. Um, but that's sort of the, the, the story behind the names and, and different things. Yeah. Okay, so that's interesting. I didn't know 
about that. So, right, because I, I tend to remember something about it being the Prince podcast. So I didn't know you had to change it, right? Yeah, because they have their own official right. podcast. Now, so I, I got it, and I'm not trying to oh, cause cool. any drama or anything. And I figured, hey, the people who know, who want to know about what we're doing, they already know. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people know where you are and can find you as well. Absolutely. But So, okay, so the podcast juice, it's an umbrella for mm-hmm. many other shows that you do include. And you have uh, colleagues as well. You work with other people. Yes. Over the years, uh, like I said, it started with me and Tobias. Um, and then it shifted. It was me and Monique. We used to have a young lady that co-hosted with me. And uh, used to have a core group of guys. And everyone was a, had started out as a listener. It was, you know, it was like, hey, man, can I come on? And I said, hey, let's chop it up and see how it works. And, yeah, for many years, we would record every Saturday. And all of the guys or ladies, we would meet online. At the, for, for many years, I've never met anybody face-to-face. <laughs> it has always just been online thing for, you know, we would meet up, we'd do our show, uh, and we would spawn other shows and co-hosts would do it. So, yeah. Real quick, I have to shout out, you know, Big Ken, uh, Day Dropping, Big Sexy, Q-Storm, Aunt Pooh, Sean, uh, Monique, Tobias, Toya, Kanisa, <laughs> uh, Chloe, who actually lives out in your neck of the woods. Um, if I'm missing somebody, I apologize. But, yeah, we've, we've had great uh, team members, family uh, that do this with me for sure wonderful oh it sounds like a brilliant team and they all do different bits they bring different uh elements to yeah the- yeah absolutely and, and in their own right they're all like doing great things out in the world and have these great careers as i'm always just like wow you guys want to work with me like i'm just doing this you guys are like big time lawyers or um, working in hollywood and different things but it's cool because we all sort of have the same you know we're all brought together because we love prince music exactly you know so i always think that that's that's another reason why prince is so great like the community that has spawned around him uh, is incredible because there's a lot of talented beautiful people uh that i met through being a prince fan and i think a lot of them have that same ab- admiration for his work ethic and his this high level of uh, greatness and quality when you do something. You always try to do the best you can do. Uh, and that's what I always try to do with the podcast. That's why I created work at like a job. I'm like, yo, we're going to do this on a high level. Let's do the best we can. Let's represent this thing right. And that's the only way we could do it. You know, that's always been my kind of thing that I try to push out. So yeah, work it like a job. I remember uh, I was going to Paisley Park one time. I think it was the celebration or something. And I was walking outside and there's like a there's like a highway that goes in front of that building. I don't know if you've been there. And I'm just walking up toward the building, and somebody was in a car, and they just, yo, Michael, they ain't working like a job, and just kept on going. I was like, all right, that's what's up. There you go. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that's crazy, but yeah. So. There you go. What was it like for you when you did visit Paisley Park? Uh, the energy, because I'm always interested in the mm-hmm. feelings that things produce for us. What yes. was it like? I, I'm gonna ask you this: Have you been there before? No. I haven't. Um, it was, uh, it was incredible. Yeah, I'm a long time Prince fan. I first time I went to Paisley Park was in 2016. I think so. All of those albums and all these years being a fan, never been there before. Uh, me and my best friend who started the podcast. We went together, and it was for the Prince piano. My piano on a microphone show yes it was the debut of that so we I, I remember this i just remember we we're driving coming down the street it's nighttime it's cold there's snow out and we get to the street and you can see the building just to see the building mm. i was like oh wow and we both looked at each other like that's it right there we've seen pictures of this we've talked it's right there. And just the reality of the building was a lot. I was like, man, you know, we both looked at this. This is what you can accomplish. Yeah. You could do something like that. And when we finally get up to going in, and I always say this on the show, 
uh, one of my friends from the Prince community, she's been on the show a lot. Her name was Tammy. She just happened to be standing at the front door to get inside as if she was just greeting people or something. And we had never met in person, but we knew each other from online and stuff. And she knew who I was. I just remember walking up and she's like, Michael Dean. She had her arms out and just embraced me with a nice warm hug. She said, come on in. And I, I that was like, wow. And then you just walk in. And you, when you walk into that place, again, for me, it's just like, wow, this is a man, this black man, this is the fruits of the late. Like, you could have this. This, this facility was huge. <laughs> I was just like marveling, like, wow. He made, he, he created this, like, from his music and just hard work. I was blown away. I mean, just to see it in person and see all the people that were working there. There was a lot of, again, for me, it was just, where I come from, it was all black people working there, and it was all ages. It was like there was some grandmothers working there, the younger people was working. I was just like, I would have never known this unless I came and see it for myself. And and then Prince was there. It, it was phenomenal. I'm just I'm not even going all that deep, but it was. Uh, yeah, for your first time, if you're a fan, you have to go. Like it's just like. They have to see it for yourself. Uh, I couldn't describe it, but to see it, to see some of his stuff out, and you're like, oh, that's the thing he used to make this, or there goes the Purple Rain this, or here's the sign of time. You know, it's just like, ah. And then, like I said, uh, we had one for that show. It was like Friday night or something. But then they were like, come back tomorrow, and we're just going to open it up and have a party and blah, blah, blah. And I remember we came the next day and they were like, we're going to do tours. I was like, okay, cool. Like 20 bucks. If you want, if you want a tour, get in line. And I remember um, what was so cool about this. Um, there was a young man. Uh, his name was Jesse. Young brother. He must be in his early 20s. Maybe he was. And Prince had kind of took this guy under his wing a little bit. Um, but he was a fan. Uh, but he lived in the area. And so I had, I had had him on the podcast just to, you know, like, wow, you, you're getting ready, you, you're kind of hanging out with Prince and he's letting you come around and do stuff. And so he was there because he lived there. Mm -hmm. And when they were like, they were doing the tours, they were like, well, Jesse's going to be the tour guy. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, wow, this is such a great sort of thing. It's like, this is a guy that I kind of know. He's a fan like me. He's a younger guy and he's been here enough that he's going to give us tours of the place. And I just was so happy for him. And I was like, isn't that so cool of Prince to, to do that? And sure enough, you know, so we've been walking around the studios and seeing everything. And I just was like, I was like, man, that's so dope. Like I was just on a mentor, like a pop superstar dude. He didn't have to do that, befriend some of these younger people in his community and sort of empower them to do these types of things. I just thought it was awesome. And the one thing I ended to say is I remember when we did our tour and there were multiple groups of people going. And when we came back, the guys behind us, they were like, oh, man, you guys just missed it. When they took us into the control booth to kind of look around, just check it out. It was like Prince just walked in the room with a plate of cookies and he was just giving people cookies, you know, and he just kept it moving. and He just left. <laughs> I was like, that's so awesome. But uh, yeah, so Paisley Park is Amazing. Incredible. Yeah, it's in a museum now. Definitely should check it out. Right. It's a museum now. Well, have you met Prince? I've never met him personally. Like, yeah. hey, how you doing? Uh, I think the closest uh, the closest interaction is my, it sounds kind of weird. It was uh, when he was getting ready to do his first uh, website. He had reached out to a few fans uh, to see if we wanted to help, whatever. And he had emailed us all. And I was one of the people he emailed. And he had like a little line in there about each person. Like he must have somehow been kind of watching this or something. And he had, for me at the time, I was into video games and stuff. And he had typed, he had said something like, uh, Michael Dean, if you could come, uh, if you, if you can, uh, get yourself away from the games for a little bit or something to join us or something funny like that. Uh, so there's been that. Uh, uh, other than that, there's, you know, there's been interactions in terms of, hey, 
is it okay if this person comes on the podcast you know type of thing like that um and we had his sister uh oh. i'm like i can't taika right right, right. early on we had taika on oh. uh, when he was here and it was a little back and forth to make sure that was good um th they didn't tell me this to way after but there was some conversation about having me come there to Paisley Park and somehow interview him. I'm not surprised. I was like, are you kidding? <laughs> like I would have, you know, but it didn't happen. But I just was, he was definitely, definitely aware of the podcast uh, for, for good or bad reasons. Sometimes he would block some stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there was, but yeah, I, it was one of the things is um, as much as I would have loved to have met him. I don't know, like, you know, sometimes it says, they say don't meet your heroes. And I'm not a type of person. I know the type of person that I am where I come from. There's only so much kind of foolishness that I sort of will engage with when you have to deal with certain people. So it might have been good that it was just let me be the observer and I'm just giving praise, you know. What I mean? And then once he sort of passed, we just shifted to, you know, we're going to really hold up prints and make sure that you know we we show them love and respect and spread the word you know type of a deal but never yeah like i said never met him like at least not that i know i've been to concerts when he came to seattle and i'm just sitting in the front and he'll give me them he gave me the microphones like what's your name again and type of thing but i don't know if he knew who i was at that time or not but uh yeah you've had many encounters though it sounds like many yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, hmm, interesting. Um, you know, that takes me to that fateful day uh, when we all, yeah, heard the words that mm, I, I suppose nobody was really expecting. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, with Michael, we kind of saw his decline. We did. We saw how he was looking, how he was behaving. You know, with any sort of cognizance, you kind of knew that Michael wasn't well. Um, but with Prince, there was no, except for the obvious plane landing and all that, right. that, that right. happened. Uh, but then the following day, you know, he was reassuring people and all sorts. So it was one of those things. So for you... And I know many people remember the day that so and so passed and everything else. What were your feelings about when you got the news, and who who gave it to you? Who gave you the news? Um, I can't remember specifically who told me it was a text, or it might have been a phone. I remember. I just remember I was at my day job, and it, it was like the middle of the day, I think. And somebody, yeah, somebody texted me or something, and I just immediately went online. And I was like, "What?" And I was just crushed. You know, it, it was like you knew the person or something. I was just like, I couldn't believe it. And I just, I had to go home. And I was just like, you know what? Yeah, I, was, I don't know if that sounds weird or not, but I just said, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. I'm not. I'm done for the day. I can't do it. And I just had to go home. And, you know, on the way home, you're starting to see all the, inf you know, information's coming. Like, they don't know for sure. They knew for sure, you know. And uh, what we ended up doing that, I got home and I called the fellas up. I said, yo, we need to get on the mics right now, you know. And we just got on and we took uh, phone calls and stuff and just try to just be in the moment of this together, you know, and try to, you know be some type of support or you know just we're all just in the same like just disbelief but i figured it might be better to do it together um so that's what that, i remember that you know and just yeah it was it was unbelievable it, uh, sad even to this day i it, it pisses me off it's just like you know um and like you said you don't know what's going on we're outsiders obviously with anybody's health situation um, but when the plane thing did happen, you know, it was just to me, I was just like, whatever's going on, just stop. 
well, somebody somebody must have his back and hold that brother down, whatever needs to happen, but get some help. Something's going on, you know. And it just that's what pisses me off. It's like, God, I don't know if he was just not trying to listen to nobody, if he was just being prince. <laughs> but uh like I said, well, I, I said earlier, the lessons learned is as great as he is and was, he's not here. And he, he could be, you know, and so one of the lessons I took from that, same thing I take with Michael or whoever, as great as these people are, man, like the, the simplest things of being humbled, listening to somebody other than yourself, and to be able, as a man, to be able to say, you know, I need some help. And, you know, uh, not trying to hide everything. You know, I hate that he had to feel like he had to hide and have a facade. Because I was like, damn, brother, if you're hurting, it's no problem. There's nothing wrong with displaying that I need some help or I'm going to get help or I'm going through something. It ain't all good, you know, even though, you know what I mean? And I just wish that that's something I learned from that, seeing that, like, yeah, I'm not going to ever be scared to get some help or be seen like I might be a little weak right now. Yeah, that's not, that helps nobody. It doesn't help him, you know, uh, and that's a lesson. And, you know, I, I say, especially for a black man, that's a lesson to learn. Like, we got to be on our health. We always want to be seen as strong and can't nothing tear us down and whoopie woo. But, man, if you're hurting, the people under you need you to be humble enough to let them, let them hold you for a minute, you know, and get you some help. So that's yeah, it's that's the for me that's the tragic part of Prince. Like, you know, as much as he gave to us, it's almost like he put the persona and he put his job uh, over his own well-being. Almost like he wanted to perform for us so bad or have the face of nothing is bothering me, but honestly, it is bothering me, brother. You know, you passing out on planes and having to get these medications off, you know, just, ah, uh, it's, it's sad. Very sad, yeah. yeah. And unfortunately, it's one of those things that addiction um, is, is a very hidden thing. People think they're hiding it, but it's very mm -hmm. apparent to people who are around so anybody who's ever been around somebody who's addicted to prescription pills or whatever it is, you can see it. So, um, so that, mm. for me, there's a lot still not having. A lot of people aren't saying anything because I know that people. Right. Have seen it. As a psychotherapist, this is the work I do, so I know that people would have seen what was going on. Now, the difference is whether the person will get the help or not. That's the difference. Right. Yeah, as I said. Yeah, you know, he's a person that want to do. He's always done his own thing. I get that. I understand. You're not trying to listen. You can't really. Some people you just can't tell them that. <laughs> but there's, that's why I say there's got to be somebody that you got to listen to, no matter who you are. We all need counsel at some level. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's got to be. And I'm just saying, I, I never want to get to the point where you never can. Nobody tell you nothing. Can nobody tell Michael Jackson nothing if you don't want to do it? And then, okay. Can't nobody tell Prince nothing if you will, okay. Can nobody tell Whitney Houston what to do? Somebody needs to tell some. I mean, we all got to have, and that's, you know, that's why I think, too, we all at least got to have, this is my opinion, especially I speak to the men, the fathers out there. I'm fine. We still got to have something over us, whether that's the spiritual father, real father, something that we can get counsel to so that we can govern and shepherd our flock, our family, our kids. We can't just go off. Of, oh, I think I know we all got to be held accountable to something. And we got too much to live for. Prince got too much to live for, you know, but. Uh, yes, that's an interesting point. But I, I do wonder if he even felt he had a lot to live for because the art is one thing, but. Right. We all know he never created a family life for himself as such. Um, right, right. And I'm not saying that everybody has to have children or anything like that. Many people are very happy without them. Um, but 
you know, he's had failed relationships and lots of stuff. So it's a complicated, I think we're dealing, I think we were, we're looking at a very complicated man. Oh, absolutely. As we all are. Yeah. And we all have our things. And so I'm not judging anything at all. I'm just, I'm just saying. Absolutely. Uh, logically, we should all be able to look at everybody and say, you know, I can learn something from absolutely. that person's situation, you know. That's just one of the things I choose to want to learn. I, yeah, I already know he's a musical genius and super disciplined. You know, I get that. And I can also learn that, too. One of his most important lessons to me as a man is like, yeah, I got to be here, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I can be like that. So I can live to the level of what he lived. You, you have to be here to live that. Mm. You know? Yeah. But I, you know, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to go down the road of sound like I'm speaking negative of, of that situation. I'm not like, no, no, it doesn't sound like you are, but I agree with what you're saying. Really. It feels like a waste. Um, it's something that could have maybe been helped. I remember my neighbor was around that day and he, he was saying, how is it that Keith Richards and Jimmy Page <laughs> is still walking around in friends? <laughs> right. You know, it, when, when we feel these things, I mean, he wasn't saying anything about, uh, negative about Keith or Jimmy, but I know what he was saying, how these yeah. guys abuse oh, God knows what. Yeah, well, it's, you know, there, there's also an ac epidemic going here in the mm -hmm. state involving fentanyl and these fake pills and all this. And it, maybe that's just a wake-up call to how severe this situation is here because he's not the only prince was not the only yeah, one uh that is that, that that happened to and still going on to this day but it, the fact that it can reach a guy like that just kind of really shows how much of an issue these illegal drugs and you know counterfeit and just that whole underbelly you know is just underneath the surface of regular society that it's dangerous like this is a dangerous place you know you you're going to be getting stuff. You got to know where it's coming from because there's a whole other underbelly that they don't care. They'll throw in the most hardcore narcotic and whatever and some little peel. And just to make money, they'll sell it to anybody. I don't care. Well, that's, uh, that's not really supposed to kill people. So what? Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, dangerous. But yes, no, you're right. Uh, yeah, it's dangerous. And it always is anyway. It always has been. But... Yeah, now, as you say, there is this epidemic. Um, but, you know, I suppose the way he died, um, you know, we saw the world, didn't we? I mean, what are your thoughts? How did you see what how the world responded? Beautiful. And, and it, it was a testament to everything he put out to the world. He'd been spending a majority of his career expressing love unity for people and you saw that for the from of course from the hardcore prince fans but it was everybody else who was casual or just knew a princess there was a level of love and respect and like oh no not him like that guy was special and i, I can't remember what it was was they were you know all the purple lights Australia. around the world and stuff yeah it's, it was beautiful like it just again it goes to show that's our superpower you know, and it was appreciated. You know, they saw in the world, yeah, he will be, man, he meant a lot to us. You know, and we're going to give him some love back. Uh, and even to this day, of course, it always happens when people die. But I think with him, it's even it's even more like, yeah, I respect Prince. Like, that guy put in work. I, I've been to Paisley Parker many times since then, and I've went on the tours. And at the last time I went, it were people there who weren't hardcore Prince fans. They just came into town and they were like, oh, there's, you can go see Prince's house. And they came and they were just there. Wow, this is great. And they were learning and they just appreciate it. You know, they were like, yeah, this guy's incredible. I, I want to see this. And so I think it's, you know, it's great. You, you see everything that he put out. It's in the world. You know, when some people say his name, it's always said in a, Oh yeah, oh, you like that song? Or oh, I love, I loved Prince. Or it's never in a hateful way, you know, which, which I love. And so that's the best thing too. Like, yeah, you can put that out there, and it's motivating a whole new generation of people. One of the great things about doing this podcast is there's a lot of new, younger people 
getting in the prints and they'll come across the podcast and then they'll reach out to me and like, man, thank you. Like I never knew it was all, this was what Prince was. And now I'm all into it. Um, I had some school, I was a student actually came on one of the live shows we did. And he was like, my teacher brought me here to you. He talks about you in the class. I wanted to get into Prince. And he said, start with this guy or whatever. So I was like, that's Prince again, like just bringing people together. You know, it's about, he was putting out a certain type of vibration and themes and love and all generations can, can get something out of it. So it was great. Yes. Your mental health is a priority. Nine Pitches Therapies offers gentle and soothing therapy for your mind, body, and soul. These self-help recordings focus on improving the quality of your life by providing you what you need right now, be it confidence, positivity, restful sleep, or relaxation. The soothing, calming music has been specially composed to accompany the body of words created by me, an expert in this field, to help you to achieve the best result. Reprogram your mind using the most gentle and effective guided meditations that can help you to clear and cleanse any unwanted energy that may be negatively affecting your life. Improve the quality of your life in just a few minutes a day. Nine Peaches Therapies, Holistic Therapeutic Consultancy. I was going to ask you about that because um, I noticed that there are these reaction channels uh, now yeah. that people are, the younger generation are listening to. Um, I mean, it's something I can't get into, but I know, you know, James has shown me people reacting to Prince and I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, but, but what are your thoughts? Have you seen any of that? Or what, what yeah, uh, I've seen them. I've started doing something myself. Oh. Um, I think they're great. Yeah. Um, I love watching younger people's reactions to not only Prince's stuff, but even some stuff that was sort of outside of their generation. It's just interesting to see how they take it, you know, what they think about it. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it. I think it's a sense of discovery yes. for a lot of people, and it's, a, and it's a communal experience. You know, it's sort of bringing back the, hey, I'm going to, it's, it's like almost like a radio DJ breaking a record for the first time, or at least to them, and you kind of get to watch now. But now we get to see it in a generational sense because there's the viewers who are the kids' age watching it who just might not see the big deal about it. But I think it plays really to the adults who are of age when those songs came out. It's more remarkable to watch, oh, okay, these actually this young man actually sees the artistry or what's great about this and it kind of makes you feel good like yeah they appreciating the stuff i was into yeah. in that time that's kind of how i mm -hmm. sort of look at them and, I'm, and i i like the ones who can sort of articulate what they're hearing or what it feels like to them and i love seeing them saying like you know i think i have heard this i'm going to kind of go down the rabbit hole a little bit more because i'm kind of digging this and sometimes they'll even They'll say, hey, this reminds me of some artists that they know of their time. And they realize, wow, a lot of the stuff that I like is influenced by Prince, for example. Um, I do the reaction from a different standpoint of I know these songs. Like yes. I know them note for note, word for word. So I give a different style of, of a reaction where it's more like you may know this song, too, because you're my age. But maybe I'm going to add something to it that you never even thought about when you were listening to this. Uh, and, and then again, we play it together. So it's a communal thing. I actually do them live. Uh, we'll go for like an hour and we'll just jump to different songs and we'll talk about it, play them. Sometimes I'll be like, you know, this song sounds very much like this other artist's song. You're like, Oh wow. And I see where Prince got that from type of thing. So I think the reactions are a great, it's a new 
communal thing that we never had before because they, they couldn't do that on TV and speak to us live. It'd be too expensive. But now with technology, the floodgates are open and anybody can be like, hey, you like this too? Cool. I like, you like that? I like it. Well, check out, you know, uh, video game reactions is another big thing. Just people like to watch people playing a game and commentating. They see themselves and my daughter is is she's into my, my younger daughter at seven she likes to watch certain young kids play games yes and i can and i understand I, I see why they like that we didn't have that when we were kids you know yeah. you had to go over the person's house exactly they're like, your buddy. They're like oh you want to listen to the new punch record okay i'll be over in a minute and we'll sit there and listen to it together now you can do it with hundreds of people uh, yeah. from any background which is incredible Definitely. Oh, I agree. I think it's brilliant that they can do that. Um, I have 24 hours in a day, and a lot of it's spent doing other stuff. So I may look at a reaction now and then, but I can't get into it too much. Now, what I have seen uh, is some reactions to Zeppelin, because Led Zeppelin's always mm. been one of my favorite bands. But I just to mention, I think Prince was influenced by a lot of rock bands as well. I think mm -hmm. the way he dressed. Uh, Robert Plant used to wear women's blouses, pretty much. You know, um, ruffles and everything. And so the early Prince, with all that, was very reflective for me with, with a lot of that. Um, gotcha. And certainly Steven Tyler used to wear the scarves and, and then the hair. Prince straightened his hair and... At the time, the rock bands were all about the big hair. You know, Robert Plant yeah, yeah. had these golden curls, and Steve Perry Journey you, had that straight hair. And yeah, let's see if you go down their rabbit hole. I think you will see that they all got that from Sly Stone, which predated absolutely, all those. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yeah. all filtered down from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And even Zeppelin got all their blues from Sonny Boy Williamson and BB King and every all the other. Right. Black musicians from the south absolutely and so this generation the reason why i bring that up i want to ask you your thoughts about you know this generation it's great that they're watching you know prince for the first time mm -hmm. but how how is the new generation going to be inspired to get back into playing live music put away put put away drop the auto tune um write some inspirational lyrics how's that going to happen because it see you know you opened the, the the interview tonight with some interesting things about how the trajectory how we've moved mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just wonder how we're going to get back what are your thoughts about That's that a good question well uh and this may shock some people I, I i don't think that going back to live instruments the way that we think of it is the move. Oh, okay. Now, times, society, civilization always changes. Yes. Goes around and different things. And I think coming from everything we just talked about in the 70s and 60s, 70s, 80s, 2000s, rap, you know, hip hop was sort of like, okay, we don't have the live instruments, but we are musical people. Yes. We're always going to be musical people. We're, us being musical is not dictated by the tools it takes to make music. Okay. Us being music is here. <laughs> is here. The heart of what we do. We can be hand using our, we'll yeah. make music like that. And we're going to make dope music no matter what it is. So to me, uh, it'll never be about the, uh, the the music being dictated by the instrument. Uh, so when I say that, um, yes, I would love to see live instrumentation, but I really would just like to hear good music okay. at the end of the day, however that is created. I think once you try to put a filter or a or a, a stopgap, and this is how you're supposed to do it. Yes. Then to me, it's not going to be real music no more because you can't do that. That's not how creativity creativity works. Right. And any people we've shown through history will show you that 
if it was to be dictated that you had to play real instruments, the largest music genre of the world would not exist, which is hip hop. Right, definitely. <laughs> Where is rock music at right now? Where is uh, all of these? They exist, but the one that they said wasn't a real music genre is above them all. Right. You know, you remember in the 80s, there was oh, rap is not real. That's not going to last. That's not a real thing. Yes, that's true. Well, actually, it has, and it has blown all the other ones out. Yes. Right? The yes. rock star is the rap star. Yeah. That's the rock star. Right. So to me, it is whatever medium the artistic people of the world choose to use. And could it be more electronic? Could it be? If it's good music and it reaches the soul of the people, why would it matter? Mm. If what they're saying speaks to the psyche of the people at that given time, then that's the good music. I may not like it or it may not speak to me. I may not be into the very aggressive, you know, violent, whatever, just give an example. But if that's the consciousness of the society at that moment, they're going to be into it. Hopefully, the society's consciousness can shift to different messages. I'm down with that. But if it if it's still going to be electronic or, you know, I don't know if you heard, AI is actually creating music now. Then that's what it will be. Uh, you know, you were asking about my book later, but some of these ideas that I have about music is I see that there's AI music being created now as there are AI books being written and videos and that thing. And it, again levels the playing field from a person who doesn't have access to traditional mm. music tools, but the creative people who don't think of you can only do things a certain way, they're going to get these tools, whether it be the keyboard or their phone, and they're going to create something incredible. And they're going to create something that, oh, did you hear it? Yeah, that was great, man. Play it. Oh! And it's, they're not going to care how it was yeah. made. It sounded great. Or I identify with the tone of that person's voice or whatever he was saying. Just like hip hop didn't care and shouldn't care that it was built on samples, but it was creative. It was kids who just said, well, I'll have access to my parents' turntables, but we're still going to have a party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm still going to make some music. I'll, I'll use your music in a way you never imagine but you never had these obstacles in front of you so why would you have thought to do that so that's my point is to say art is going to react to the obstacles in front of it and it's going to be dope regardless yes so okay that's, that's my answer point. to that is like hey yeah that's a very good point <laughs> yeah prince would have if prince would have been restrained to oh you could only use live instruments on your record we would have never had him playing the drum machines we had never had him doing synthesizers. He would have been forced to use horns that yes. he couldn't afford to have on his records, right? He didn't care about that. I'm going to make the songs because this is how I can, these are the tools I got to make them. I'm just going to make you love these tools because I'm going to do dope stuff that can't nobody else do and they're going to all follow me. I think that's where music is always going to be headed by the true hungry musician type cats, whatever they do. If it's typing on a keyboard and it's creating a beat, so be it. If it's hypnotic, it's going to rock. And they're yes. not going to care about if they studied whoever. You know, when yeah. you start putting rules on art, that's when it ain't art no more. Absolutely. When you were saying that, it did remind me of New Wave when it came in and people were saying, oh, these synthesizers, oh, good. And people, we were eating it up. You know, you couldn't get it fast enough. So, yes, absolutely right. And, of course, hip-hop was a social shift. It was a real revolution. You know, people were saying things that needed to be said and still are. Even when they weren't saying anything that needed to be said, yes. it was like, yeah, that music is incredible. Yes. Like, the sound of that music. It's no other way. No one could do it unless you adhere to how it was being done. It was against everything that they said it was supposed to, how you were supposed to create it. Even Prince was like, what the hell is this? Like, I you know, whole songs about like, this is not, this ain't it. But then he realized, actually it is. This exactly. is everything I did. It's just kids yeah. doing it. Got to get on board with it. So 
I remember the inflection of when Curtis Blow was saying, these are the breaks, and just the way his voice would go up, these are, and you just felt it. And yeah. it was the music, but it was also the voice mm -hmm. and what he was saying as well. So, yes, that was a shift. And I think it created a shift in consciousness as well. So, absolutely, absolutely I agree with you. So, yes, we have to break that whole mold about creativity. So do you think creativity, you think we're born with it, or is it something that we learn? Um, no, I think it's something in, in us. Um, I think there's things in our DNA that we don't even know why certain people do certain things. I think there is a thing about certain people with rhythm, or there's a certain thing people about math or whatever it is. But I think creativity is innate. I think we are more creative at things than other people and that speaks to everybody some people are great at crafting something and don't even know why they're great at crafting things or whatever but i would imagine you probably go back a couple of generations and you're sure your family came from that they were doing that or you heard that all the time and you reacted a certain way to this this rhythm or the the, the sound i think you know the sound of like a preacher's voice, uh, that's creative to me because I think a lot of people can have that but don't know it or just don't, they're not in tune with their own creativity that they can do naturally uh, and what that means to people. You could speak to somebody in a certain way and know that you know how your tone is going to affect that person when you speak to Like a father knows I could use a certain tone to kids and they're going to want to fall in line with me. And it, just instinctively, they're going to know. And I think artists do that. Some of them don't even know they're doing it, but some of them have. I think Prince locked into, he understood, I can sing this song a certain way, and women are going to feel something with this. And I think once he, once he locked into that, which I think would be like in the 1999 time when he understood sonically how I sound, and I'm going to mix that with visually how I look, I will be irresistible to certain people. <laughs> like, And he plays on it his whole career. Like, I want to make the voice and the presentation irresistible. Like, he tapped into He's not looking into, he just happens to look a certain way or he's moving a certain way. No, he realized, I see the reaction this is getting. I'm about to fine-tune this. And I think each album, he just fine-tuned it more every time and switched it up just a little bit. But he knew what you were looking for, and he knew it. He gave off almost an energy like, and I know this is getting you. And you know I know you, but I'm getting you right now. Like, and it sort of throws that playfulness in it. But I think he's just a master of understanding his innate talent, which is why I say music is a superpower, because I think people like Prince, Michael, James, uh, Jagger, they, they are like, they, I wouldn't be surprised if they are like, uh, coming from something that they don't even understand. Like there was maybe somebody in their family generations ago that was doing the same type of thing. It may have been music, but it was in something where they just have a, a something that comes out of them that people respond to. I think Michael Jackson is a perfect example of of the highest level of that because even my daughter who was never around when michael jackson was famous or he's dead when she was born she's a michael jackson fan like she just hears the voice and then it got her and i noticed when she would see the videos she walk in the room and she was just enamored and it took her a second to know that that's the same person because your know, skin got a little lighter but when she realized it was the same dude and he was also that little kid that she sees in some videos. She's just, it's just something, I think there's something in his voice that attracts children to just identify. Like they don't even, they don't know nothing about it, but they can hear one of them songs and they are into it. Like, oh, oh, this is great. And now she's doing the dancing. And, you know, her favorite song is bad. Like, she just loves, she likes looking at it. She thinks it's funny in a sense, because it's so, oh, sh -sh -sh -sh. Yeah. <laughs> this is so incredible and she's like you never see stuff like that and she's just into the song like there's something about it 
And she like, like I said, I mentioned Destiny album earlier. I have that CD. I, I went and bought that CD a month ago just to play it in the car. And instantly she's like, I catch her singing the songs, you know. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Like I was younger than her listening to that. And I, I was singing the song. So I just think that there's certain superpower. There's, there's something in music. No matter what music you're in, you could be in the jazz, but it's just there's something in it that uh, I think speaks to people. And you know, going back real quick to, to say about the AI thing, in that book that you got, you know, there's a different version that I'm writing on, more expanded. But in this, in a, in a world that I sort of present, is what if AI bought up all the music? Like you hear nowadays, you know, Michael Jackson's getting ready to sell his catalog. I don't know if you saw that in the news the other day. Yeah. All these people are selling their catalogs to these companies that obviously have billions of dollars to just be accumulating all this stuff. And I thought it would be interesting if a lot of this stuff was bought and they took it out of circulation. And the idea is to take it out so you forget about it and then have like the AI thing recreate that stuff using like it would take it could take michael's catalog it could take prince's it could take the beatles and throw an algorithm and let it create something entirely new based off of it and it would be super derivative because it's literally taking the greatest parts and making something new almost like hip-hop but if they took out all of those classics out of circulation you could conceivably change the way humans perceive art to think that only computers are smart enough and logical enough to actually make art and that no human could actually really create anything like they're not good at it and it would change the dynamic of everything if we just thought that all movies all books all anything humans could never make shouldn't you shouldn't be making it there's no way they can make it as good as the computer because the computer can outthink us anyway it thinks faster than us and it has no correlation to time and so if they, and I, my point is, say, if you look back in history, when they take things out of circulation, people will forget about certain things. Yes. And then they'll reintroduce it in a different way and start to change the way you think of things. Like, well, of course, yeah, this is always associated with this. You know, religion is an example. Like, they say, well, religion has been around forever. If you could take Africans away from Africa and bring them to another country, separate them and take their religion out of their consciousness, reintroduce religion to them, but have your face in front of it, you could change the dynamic of people and subjugate them just by simply making them think the thing that spiritually is in tune to them is from somebody else, and they forget that they had this religion before they came here or whatever. You, you could do the same thing with music. And again, my the book's stance would be well, see, AI has no comprehension of time. It's yeah. not going to get old. So it may be like, hey, I'm playing a long game. I can wait 50 years. Wow. And just start systematically start doing these things slowly. By the time these humans realize what's going on, we own everything. We've taken things out of circulation and reintroduced new faces to it. It could be a world where art, all art is created by these things. And it wouldn't be how we think technology is supposed to be the Terminators and, you know, the Matrix. It may be nothing like that. It, it could be like, no, we know that culture, storytelling, and myth defines humans to a T. Yes. And if you could change that to the, that we are the gods and heroes of the stories, then, yeah, they would bow down to, they wouldn't even know they're doing it. Like, again, you take it out of circulation so long, you could wait a couple of generations. The computer doesn't care because it's not going to get old anyway. So right. it'd be a day. It could be a day for them, but right. for us, time would have went by to the point where a couple of generations later, so the song would come on. It could be this uh, mashup of Michael and Prince, and the kids of that generation would argue with the really super old people. When the super old people would be like, "I remember when that was Michael Jackson," they'd be like, "That wasn't real. There was no such." That Michael Jackson, Prince, that was a fantasy. That wasn't real. This is the real. What are you talking about? I can see that. So that's the premise I, I'm working on for, for a book. But 
Yeah, well, let's talk about your book because you're, you're an author. Um, you published a book called Truth, Destiny, the Destiny Saga book. So this is book one that's out, published in 2014. And you've yes. just been talking about book two that you're working on. But so, this is a yeah. sci-fi book. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is a sci-fi book where you've made a black woman the lead. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I, I just wondered why that hasn't happened before. So when I saw your book, mm. I thought, fantastic. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, so uh, Truth, Destiny uh, was my attempt. <laughs> As I'm a sci-fi guy. I'm a yes. reader. I, I want to yeah, yeah, yeah. be an author. I, I wrote that. And that was just supposed to be like a prequel for the grander story that I was going to tell. So this book that I'm mentioning, this new one, is actually the same book you got, but the the real story behind okay. it. And it's been expanded. So now it's called, I can tell you it's called Brown Sugar Messiah now. Oh. Uh, the character Truth changed her name to be called Messiah. Her, her name is Messiah, but people call her Messiah. But... Uh, the book or the story, I'll just, I'm going to tell you all the setup. And this is forcing me to really finish up on this. So the setup is kind of the same what you read. There's a spaceship that crashes into this concert that's going on. Well, actually, now what happens is this spaceship comes to Earth and is crashing. But who is on this spaceship that crashes? It is AI-created versions. They're AI robotic versions of Michael Jackson and Prince. <laughs> and wow. they crash into this concert that the lead character messiah is at messiah she is kind of like a hacker as well she's a young girl young black girl but she is enthralled with 80s music and this takes place way in the future at this concert which is the biggest concert in the world it is these ai performing artists that are the biggest artists in the world all artists at this point are AI Android type people. And she hacks into the concert feed and starts playing When Doves Cry. And this concert is going out to the world. And it also is going out at this point. Uh, humans have started colonizing out into space. So there's space station, orbital space stations that a lot of the rich and stuff, they live in these big things. So the signal is going out all over the place. So this signal goes out. And the ship that I mentioned with the AI versions of these two icons sees this as an opportunity to help humanity and fight these AI overlord types of things. So when it crashes here, it sets off a chain of events that uh, Messiah, along with these two, you know, unexplained sort of AI creations of these musical icons, has to come together and help humanity you know, get humanity back from these AI overlords of sense. And really, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story about speaking about how culture is so important to us as people, uh, to all humans, for that matter. And is just in, in how important culture is, even in a world that is dominated by technology, the internet, um, as we're moving into people getting implants. Mm -hmm things of that nature we're, we're, and, and it's also a world where there's a universal basic income um, and how does that affect things where you always are going to get a paycheck no matter what happens but you know that opens the door for a lot of things and it's so far in the future where s some of the things that are happening today you'll kind of see like wow how that played out a little bit uh, in the future some of those are funny some of it could be very dark um, but you know, the importance of music, how it plays to us. And it's, uh, if you ever heard of like Ready Player One, uh, which was a sci-fi story that was very nostalgic to the 80s, this sort of plays the same way, except for it's nostalgic to uh, like black music specifically from the 80s and its influence and even some movies and things of that nature. Um, and it's, a, and it, with all that said, it is hopefully told in the vein of like a Star Wars, but with our reality and the people that we're into so there you go so brown sugar messiah there you go <laughs> well, okay. i i though i see that as a film this is a movie. It could easily be a movie yes i wish i wish 
well, you wish you've got to yeah, speak it into existence. This Absolutely. is definitely a movie. I could see. I I need the popcorn as you were talking <laughs> about it. I needed popcorn. I needed to watch this. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, you, in in the title itself is actually a play on words to D'Angelo's album cover. So his first album was called Brown Sugar. Okay. His second one, or his last one, was Black Messiah, I believe. And so I'm also showing you how things sort of tie together and the fact that this young lady's name is Messiah and some could call her a brown sugar because she's a very beautiful black woman as well. And yeah, so. Amazing. <laughs> but this will be one of the first films though with uh, a black woman with that much, I suppose, influence, power, um, all of it combined. This will be some yeah. sci-fi. In, in the sci-fi genre. I want it to be, uh, yeah, and actually, I don't know if I... I know it's you a book. I, know I, have this, book. I have this great uh, cover art that I have already had done. Uh, oh, wow, it. okay. Pretty cool, but... Uh, well, something for us to look forward to, though. Absolutely. I'm, now you got me more excited. <laughs> well, this is fantastic, because a lot of us do love sci-fi. A lot of people do. Um, you know, every, it's not everybody's genre, but they do. Yeah, and it's not like it's it's not going to be Oscar. heavy sci-fi. It's going to be fun, adventurous. It's going to be funny. Um, it, you know, I, I call it. It's a it's a mix between uh, Star Wars meets Menace to Society uh, with a little bit of Purple Rain thrown in. Oh, nice! <laughs> you know, nice. Ah, so we have that to look forward to. That's fantastic. Absolutely. But you, so you're an author, you write. Is there any skill that you wish you could acquire that you don't have? Oh, many. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, to, I, I say that I, I actually, I'm trying to this, acquire the skill of author writer. I have the skills of storytelling. Yeah. Uh, but sit down, you know, that's a skill. Um, I would love to be a. I would love to be able to draw. Like I again, I'm such a, a visual guy. So I, I'm like, if I could draw like animation, if I could be in animation or uh, comics or something, I'm fascinated with that. Just the skill and the patience to sort of be able to draw a panel that conveys something in the without words. You could look at oh wow okay. Awesome. So I would love the talent of drawing. I would love the talent. I'm into, um, it doesn't sound kind of weird, but when I see people that can do carving really? or like statues and stuff, like those highly detailed, I'm like, wow, what kind of mind does it take to be able to take a mm -hmm. square and carve it into this life, real life detailed thing? I think that's uh, fascinating. Um, you know, other than that, uh, I'm still learning to be a great father. That's what I'm trying to learn to be, like a better, and you can always learn. That's the one thing I continue to keep wanting to learn because it is so important uh, and it affects the, my kids. That's the number one thing I'm really studying. <laughs> Staying up late at night, like, okay, how can I be better at this? Um, yeah, the school of parenting never closes, so yeah. we're all it was, it was always open constantly. Absolutely, yeah. You know, Michael, what is the one thing that you've learned about Prince, though? Your association association with doing everything, the podcast, the connections you've had, the people you've spoken to. What is it that you take away about him? What do you? What would you <laughs> most want people to know? Um, with hard work and determination and love, you could accomplish just about anything. And I would just use him as an example, like, you know, uh, as a, a kid who wanted to play the piano that his dad played, wanted to play like his dad, led to this, um, wanting to impress his father by showing him that he could play the piano just as good as he could led to this. That's what I would, to me, that's what's, so you never, 
can underestimate the love of a child for the affections of their parent can lead kids to creating like a body of work like Prince did. You know, I think that's that's to me what's as I'm older now looking at Prince, that's the thing that blows me away about it. Um, so that, that would be my answer. Amazing stuff. Thank you for that. Wow, this has been fascinating. I've gotten to know a bit more about you as well and about why you do what you do. And we, we're we going to look forward to more amazing interviews and podcasts from you. All the details are going to be in the show notes, guys. Go and follow the podcast on all streaming platforms, but also on YouTube. That's the that's the big one. So you can... Yes. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having this conversation with me. This was uh, excellent. I, I had a great time. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's been amazing. I hope you come back at some point. Absolutely. Oh, of course. Especially when this new, when this uh, second part of the book comes out. That's okay. Great. Awesome. All right. Awesome. Yes. Thank you, Michael. Anything else you want to say before we go? Anything we need to look out for that's coming? Um, out? Interviews or? Uh, you know what? I would just say work it like a job. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> And, and uh, whatever it is that you do, just give it your all. Man. That's it. You know, whatever it is, just loving somebody that, you know, give it your all. Fantastic. Well, keep doing what you do, because those of us who love Prince and his music, his legacy, appreciate everything you've done, all the work you, because it's hard work. Thank you. Thank um, you. All the hard work that you've put in and continue to put into it and all your colleagues as well. So thank you for that. And um, we'll see you soon. See <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure you subscribe and follow on all streaming platforms. Leave me a comment and also let me know if there's any particular topics you'd like me to discuss. See you next time. <laughs>